and we'll pick up um, from the where we left off on uh, Thursday. All right, here we go. Okay, so just to quickly remind you what was happening, uh, we were doing, uh, we were looking at floating point uh, numbers in uh, Java, uh, which behave the same as floating point numbers in C for the most part. Um, where we left off, we were talking about uh, addition and subtraction. Uh, so remember when, you, uh, so I guess I should remind you of a few things. So our floating point format uses four digits, right? Three of them are the, uh, what are called is what are called is what is called the significant, right? So we have a three-digit integer number that represents uh, part of our number. The rest of our floating point number is represented by uh, by taking the significant and multiplying it by ten, raised to some exponent, right? And the exponent is also a um, integer number. In our floating point format, the integer is between minus five and four. Right? Now to do addition. <clears throat> or subtraction, uh, you write your numbers as uh, in your floating point format. Right? So here we write 10.5 and 9.98 in their uh, floating point format. So we get 105 times 10 to the minus 1, and we get 99 times 10 to the minus 1. Uh, right? We get 99 because um, we don't have the fourth digit that we need to represent the 8. Right? Uh, remember when we're doing addition or subtraction, we keep the exponents the same. So we need to scale the number with the smaller exponent uh, so that it has uh, the same exponent as the larger value. And that's so that all the digits line up in the significant, right? So that we can actually add or subtract them. Um, because we don't have the point 0.8 here, uh, we discard that missing digit, right? Uh, so we discard the extra digit that we can't represent in our floating point format. You do the subtraction, you get uh, 600 times 10 to the minus three. Um, if you do the the actual difference, uh, you'll find that you get uh, 520 times 10 to the minus 3. Right now, the difference between that number and that number is 80, right? which is the number of alts, units in the last place of error uh, between those two numbers. Uh, and the floating point format, the floating point standard, IEEE 754, says that when you do basic arithmetic, uh, so that's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, remainder if it supports it. Uh, you have to be within one half an alt. Right? So in other words, you have to, uh, your answer has to be, um, your answer has to be the closest floating point number that represents the true value. Right, so that's within one half an alt, uh, and that's nowhere near one half an alt. Right, that's 80 alts away. Uh, so to solve the problem, you use a guard digit. Right, so the guard digit is you just insert an extra digit. Uh, and then you perform the result using the extra digit, and then when you get to the final result, uh, you convert uh, that number back into its standard folding point format. So when I do this difference, I get 5.2 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Our floating point format has three digits for the significant, so we can write that as 520 times 10 to the minus 3, and that's the result. Right? Uh, and you can show that a single digit is not enough to ensure the one half alt error. Right. So, for example, here's an example uh, where if you actually, sorry, if you actually carry out the difference, uh, you'll end up uh, with an error of, uh, sorry, point, uh, almost point six of an alt, right, which is slightly larger than the standard allows for. Um, uh, so it turns out you need, if you're using base ten, then you need at least two guard digits uh, to solve this problem. Um, and in on a modern CPU, a modern desktop CPU anyway. Um, you normally have many extra bits uh, to perform the calculation, right? So, for example, Intel uses, uh, I believe they use 80 bits um, for their uh, for their arithmetic, for their floating point arithmetic, right? Um, and the standard says you only need 64 plus your guard digits. All right, uh, just let me quickly flip back to Teams to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Super. Okay. Uh, uh, subtraction in floating point is funny because uh, you're taking, uh, so in subtraction, you're, um, uh, if you subtract two values that are very close together, um, then the result is a small number, right? But we've already seen uh, with floating point numbers um, that if you, if the magnitude of your number is large, 
then you can't actually represent small values, right? So, for example, if I take a large um, a number with a large magnitude um, and a number with a small magnitude, uh, then if you add them together, then typically what happens is um, the small number becomes zero, um, and so you end up with just the large number as the result. Uh, so this can be a problem when you're subtracting values because you can take two very large values that are close together and subtract them um, and the difference becomes uh, zero instead of, uh, or the difference becomes uh, very incorrect compared to the true value. Right? So this is called cancellation. Okay? So when I subtract two similar floating point values, uh, you end up with a loss of significance or cancellation. For example, I have two. Now, I'm, uh, this is just an example, right? So our floating point format is still four digits, uh, but I'm just showing you an example where you have a 10 digit floating point number. I have two 10 digit, 10 digit floating point numbers, right? That are very close together, right? So they differ only in the last digit, right? When I subtract them, uh, I end up with one times 10 uh, to the zero, right? So I end up with one. Um, and when I normalize that value, that becomes one, all zeros times 10 to the minus nine, right? So uh, my original two numbers, right? They have, well, that one has nine digits of, uh, nine, significant dig uh, nine significant digits, sorry. This one has 10 significant digits. I only end up with one significant digit, right? Uh, so there's your loss of significance. Um, it's called cancellation or loss of significance because the leftmost digits, right, uh, of the two operands cancel one another out, right? So the leftmost digits, right? So I mean uh, the number, the digits on this side of the number, right? Uh, these are also called the high order bits or the high order digits um, or the most significant digits. Right, they cancel each other out and they leave only the rightmost digits, right, or the uh, low order digits or the least significant digits. Right. Now, uh, if the two operands contain no error, uh, then the phenomenon is called benign cancellation. Right. So in this example here, we subtract these two values, we get uh, one times 10 to the zero, so we get one, but that's the correct answer. So there's actually no problem in this example. Right. Yes, we only have one significant digit, but that's because the true answer only has one significant digit. So we call that benign. Uh, but there's another type of can uh, cancellation called catastrophic. Right. So catastrophic cancellation occurs uh, when one or both of your operands contain error. Right. So the this the uh, the problem of cancellation um, only becomes significant uh, when you're doing a calculation and your operands contain error. Now, where might they contain error? So the error might arise, uh, or the error can arise, sorry, when you do a whole bunch of calculations beforehand to arrive at the two numbers you want to subtract, right? So all of your earlier floating point calculations, they all introduce a small amount of error, or they can all potentially introduce a small amount of error, right? Uh, which means that the two numbers that you end up subtracting both end up with some floating point error in them. Um, and when they uh, both have approximately the same magnitude, right, you end up with a problem. Right? So here's an example where you want to compute the, uh, the roots of a number right, using the quadratic formula. Right? So for example, so uh, in this example here, right, you've got some polynomial right, with coefficients a, b, and c. Right? You want to compute b squared, so that's a calculation, right? That's a floating point calculation, um, where not all of the digits in the final answer are going to fit in your floating point representation. Four times a times c, that's another floating point calculation, right? So again, when you do that computation, not all of the digits are going to fit, uh, may fit in the final answer. So b squared and 4ac, they're both going to, they both might contain error. Right? And here's an example of where catastrophic cancellation happens. Uh, so if I have B equals 3.34, uh, A equals 1.22, and C equals 2.28, right? then you can easily compute the exact value of this. Right? So you just use regular math to compute the exact value. Right? And when you do that, you end up with uh, 292 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? Now notice that answer, right? 
uh, can actually fit in our floating point representation. The problem is the intermediate calculation cannot, right? So that 11.1556, when we convert that to our floating point format, we're going to lose some digits. And this 11.1264, when we convert that to three di to a three-digit significant, right, we're going to lose some digits, um, which means our answer is not going to be that. Right? So our answer, our true answer, actually fits in our floating point format. The problem is we can't compute the true answer because the intermediate calculation can't. Uh, the intermediate results cannot be represented exactly. We get the answer 292, right? Now, suppose I actually do this calculation with our floating point format, right? So in other words, suppose I actually try to compute 3.34 times uh, 3.34 and this 4 times AB, right? So let's see what happens. All right, so I compute B squared, right? Now, I know that real, its real value is that, right? I also know I can't actually compute that real value, that the, the true value, right? Because I only have three digits. So I have to convert that number so that it has a three-digit significant, right? Now there's lots, of, there's uh, ways, uh, different ways you can do this. Uh, for the purposes of this lecture and for the purposes of lecture notes, I'm just going to say round uh, the result so that you get three digits, right? You might truncate, so you just might lose all the digits. Um, you might round, you might round, you might have different rounding rules. Um, but in any case, you need to convert that three, that intermediate result down back to your floating point format. So we're going to round. Right, so there I get 112 times 10 to the minus 1. When I compute for AC, right, I get that six digit number, which I round down to 111 times 10 to the minus 1. Right now I subtract that number there and that number there. Right, that number and that number, and I get 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Right, so remember what's the correct answer? It's 292 times 10 to the minus 4. The exponent's not right. None of the digits are right, right? All of the digits in the significant are wrong. The exponent is wrong, right? Uh, so I can't even compute a single digit with the correct precision, uh, with the correct accuracy. All right, and that's an example of catastrophic cancellation. Um, when you compute the error, value um, and the value computed using our floating point format, you get 708 alps, which is enormous, right? Uh, that's huge. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, there's an example of what happens. Sorry, there's an example of, uh, of how catastrophic cancellation can end up, uh, can produce a result that's very far uh, from the correct answer. Uh, now, occasionally, you will have some floating point calculation uh, that involving some formula of some kind, right? So sometimes it's possible to mathematically transform that uh, the equation that you're working with uh, so that it has a different form, right? Which avoids subtracting two similar quantities, right? So if you look at the floating point error notebook, uh, you'll see some examples of where you can do this transformation. Now this isn't um, this isn't really a math class. It's not a class in numerical calculation either. Um, so uh, we're not actually going to go through an example today. I don't think. No, we're not going to go through an example today uh, of this um, uh, of this technique. Right? It's also uncommon that you can actually do this um, because it requires being it requires number one that you're working with an equation of some kind um, that has a well known form, right, uh, or a well studied form. Uh, and then two, it requires that that form be transformable into some other form uh, where you don't perform a subtraction that leads to catastrophic cancellation. All right. Now, there is a common place. There is a there is a common uh, co uh, a common operation, however, um, that ends up that potentially ends up uh, producing a lot of floating point error. Right. And so that's when you sum many values together. Uh, so you might do this. There's lots of reasons why you want to sum many values together. Um, one of the most common, though, is when you compute an average or a standard deviation or some other statistical uh, um, quantity. Right. So if you have to sum many values together, you have to remember that every single sum potentially introduces one half of error. Right. 
So every time you sum two values, you potentially introduce a half alt bear. Um, so if I repeatedly perform that operation many times, right? So if, if I have to sum uh, n plus one values together, right? Then you end up with potentially an error of n over two alts, right? Uh, if n is very large, your final answer can have many alts of error, um, which may or may not be acceptable depending on your uh, depending on what you're using the number for. So here is an example where you get, uh, where I think for most people, this is actually a surprising result. Right? So if you actually type this into, into a main method in Java, um, uh, you, can, you can run it and see this result. So here I've got a, an array of float values. Right? Now remember float, that's the smaller version of double. Right? So it represents, a, um, it represents floating point numbers with uh, less precision than double. Right, so I've got 1001 of these float values. Right, so I'm going to stick in uh, the value 0 0.1 uh, everywhere into this array. Right, so I now have 1001 values equal to 0 0.1. Okay. I'm going to set the first element of the array to 1 million. Right, now you can see what the problem is going to be immediately. Right, here I've got a very large value. Here I've got a value that's many orders of magnitude smaller than the original value, right? Uh, so you can kind of guess that if I start to sum these values together, right? So when I take 1 million plus 0.1, I'm going to lose some of the significant digits in 0.1, right? Then I'm going to add 0.1 again, right? So that's a million and a little bit plus 0.1. So I'm going to lose digits in the 0.1, right? And then so on and so on and so on, right? A thousand more times. So if you actually compute the sum with a naive loop, um, true value, right, is 1,100, right? Because I have a thousand point ones uh, and I have a million that I'm adding together, right? So a thousand times point one is 100, plus a million is 1,100,000. Uh, if you actually compute the sum using Java or C, you end up with uh, 1,125, right? You end up with 25 ulps of error um summing a thousand values and a thousand is not very large these days right so um, these days the companies that work with large data sets i mean they routinely do operations with billions of values right uh, so this is, this can become a real problem um again right no, you should be able to recognize what the problem or why the problem occurs uh in this situation right it's because we start out and then add a small value to it, right? It turns out you can solve this problem just by moving the million to the end of the array, right? So all I have to do is instead of setting the first element to a million, I can set the last element to a million, right? And now what happens? Well, I add 0.1 and 0.1 and 0.1, right? So I add a whole bunch of small values together, uh, or I add a bunch of values who have the roughly the same magnitude, uh, and then I add the large value at the end, right? Uh, if you do this, uh, you actually end up with the correct answer, right? Because you avoid most of the floating point uh, error um, until the very last step, right? But when you do the last step, you've ended up with a hundred, rough, a number that's roughly equal to a hundred, because you've accumulated the uh, one thousand zero point one values, right? And one hundred is much closer in magnitude to one million uh, than the original point one value. Right, so it turns out 100 is large enough that you don't lose any precision in the final answer. So uh, one of the things that's, do I actually say that? Oh yeah, here it is, right? So uh, when you have to sum many values together and the uh, accuracy of the final result is critical, um, then sometimes people will say, if you sort the values, uh, this is uh, an effective way of reducing the rounding error, right? Um, that's not exactly true although it works in many cases. Okay. So what's the problem with sorting, right? So the big problem with sorting, one of the problems with sorting is that to sort um, an array or list of values, right? That has complexity in big O of n log n, right? Uh, that's the best case complexity, right? Whereas summing n values right, should have complexity big O of n, right? So now you have to, uh, now you end up, um, paying this extra computational cost to avoid the round off error. The other problem is if you sort an array, 
that changes the order of the values in the array or collection, right? Or list if you're working with a list. Um, and that may not be desirable, right? So you may not be, uh, it may not, it may be the case that whoever is giving you this list of values or this array of values to sort, uh, they don't want you to change the order of the values in the array or list, right? Uh, now to solve that problem, you can copy the array or list and then sort the copy and then sum uh, the values in the copy. Right, but now you pay the extra cost of making a copy of the original list. Right, so you pay an extra big O of N cost uh, to compute the sum. Uh, it turns out there's a better way to do this. Uh, so there's an algorithm called Khan's algorithm uh, that will actually sum N values in big O N uh, with big O N complexity without having to resort the list or array. Uh, so again, the floating the uh, floating point error notebook uh, describes this algorithm in some detail. Uh, now, um, you might think that this is all very theoretical and that people aren't really interested in this sort of uh, problem. Um, that's not true. Uh, very recently, um, someone uh, has figured out how to compute the sum um, as precisely as you can, um, much faster than using Khan's algorithm. So there's still people who are um, interested in this problem and they're still studying it today. Um, you, you might learn more about it if you take a numerical computation course. You may not, it depends on, because uh, there's a, the numerical computation is a very big field. Um, so you may or may not uh, encounter these algorithms um, in the future if you take um, some sort of uh, floating, uh, some sort of numerical analysis or numerical methods computing course. That's all I want to say about floating point values. Uh, anybody have any questions about this stuff so far? Mm, I suspect for the engineering crowd, this is not terribly difficult. Um, I do get complaints about this from the computing crowd, though. Any questions? Do all these rules? Yeah, all these rules apply to double as well, right? Because double is uh, another floating point format. Um, now the problem with so you the problem is much less acute with double than it is with float uh, because double has twice the number of bits, right? Um, so um, you so it becomes harder. Well, yeah, it becomes uh, more unusual to see these. Uh, uh, it becomes a little bit more unusual to see these results when you work in double, right? Uh, and C actually has a long double format, so it actually has a 128 bit format. Um, available uh, if your compiler supports it. Um, so uh, going up in, so increasing the number of digits in your floating point format um, reduces the uh, severity of the, but it it pushes the problem further down the line, right? You still end up with um, floating point imprecision. Um, it's just that you're less likely to see them, right? But it still occurs. All right, so let's pick up, uh, let's start the next lecture, uh, which is, uh, oh, sorry, someone's got a question here. Why do we convert to the three bit format in base 10? Does this reflect how the computer? Okay, so uh, it's a three digit format, right? So remember, bits are zero and one. So when we work in base 10, uh, they're, uh, they're base 10, they're, uh, they're normally just called uh, digits instead. So the reason that um, I'm using the three digit base 10, uh, a three digit significant in base 10 uh, is because I don't actually want to write out the 32 or the 64 bits that I'd have to do it uh, in float or double. Right, so if we actually use the binary representation, right, then all of these examples would end up with 32 uh, zeros or ones or 64 zeros or ones, and you'd have to try to convert back to decimal to see the impact of the result. Right, so it's much easier to describe this in um, base 10 with small numbers, right, with a small floating point number than it is to actually show you the, uh, than it is to try to work in the native float or double um, representation. Right, but yes, it actually does reflect how the computer works. So all of these, um, uh, all of the things that I showed you actually happen. All right. Um, Oops, that's probably, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I guess this computer wants to update too. All right, no, go away. Sorry. 
All right. Um, creating and using objects. So I think this is going to be the first uh, really big departure now for uh, um, for this group because um, uh, because your programming background has primarily been in C, uh, you will not have used uh, or had to have created or used um, uh, objects before. It's not exactly true because you've almost certainly used malloc, um, and malloc is a very we've well, used malloc and probably you use structs. Um, so those are sort of the uh, you can think of those two if you mash those two together. Uh, that's kind of a very crude type of object. All right, so Java is this object oriented programming language, right? It does have primitive values. Oops, sorry. Where's control? OK, so right. So Java does have primitive values, right? Like int and double and Boolean, right? You could write a complete Java program using only primitive values if you wanted to. Um, but most Java programmers would not do uh, would not do so. Right, so almost any non trivial Java program uh, ends up making uh, extensive use of objects uh, and the objects interact with one another. Right now, remember what an object is. So an object is just an instance of a user defined class, right? Or of a yeah, let's just stick with that. So it's a it's an instance of a user defined class or, or of a user defined type. Right now, why do we use objects? Right, uh, because objects can perform many more operations than primitive values. Right, so if you try to write your program with just primitive values and perhaps arrays, uh, you end up having to build everything yourself. Right, so if you uh, you've taken most of you have taken a data structures course, I think. Um, so for example, if you wanted to make um, a list uh, or some what else would you have done list or a tree of some kind, right? Um, you end up having to implement the whole thing yourself using primitives, um, which uh, you can do. Um, but you end up wasting a lot of time. Um, so for example, wouldn't it be nice just to find a list uh, class somewhere that someone else has already written, right? And now you've got, uh, now you can just make instances of the list and use them. Uh, so that's exactly what objects and classes let you do. So objects store information uh, in, um, in a certain kind of variable, right? Uh, so these variables, they're called fields or instance variables. And so this is the uh, field is the Java um, lingo uh, for where an object stores its information. Uh, uh, in general, object oriented terms, it's normally called, uh, you'll often see the term attribute instead of field, right? But Java uses the word field. Okay, so you've got an object, that object is allowed to have its own variables. The uh, called fields. Uh, the fields can be of primitive type, right? So you can have an object, and inside that object are just a bunch of ints or floats or something or booleans, right? Or some sort of mix, right? Uh, but in an object oriented programming language, they can also be other uh, references to other objects, right? So in Java, your fields can be reference types as well, right? So in other words, I can have an object uh, that's made up of other objects. Right, those objects are made up of other objects, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the set of values of an object's fields, that's called the state of an object. Right, so if you take all of the variables that belong to an object and you group them together, right, that's called its state. Now an object can also perform actions. Right, um, so if you have a list objects, for example, there are things you can do with the list, right? I can add things to the list. I can remove things from the list. Um, in Java, you can print the list, right? Uh, so the, met, uh, the way that an object performs these actions are with methods in Java, right? So you have an object, you call a method on the object, um, and then the object does something with its information, normally with its information. Uh, and objects, so to interact with one another, objects just ask other objects uh, to, uh, to perform actions by calling methods belonging to the other objects. Okay. So that's how they interact with one another. Okay, now how do you make an object? So uh, the life cycle of an object, right? Programmer creates an object, right? Uh, while the object is alive, it can be used. Right. So, for example, uh, you can call methods on the object. Uh, you might be able to access the field, be able to access the information stored in the object. Uh, 
you have to destroy that object. Right? So for C programmers, right, you have to call new. Sorry, you have to call malloc to create the thing. Right. Then access the um, information uh, of the thing, and then you free the thing when you're done with it. Right. So uh, in Java, the programmer can create objects. They can use objects. The destruction of objects and the freeing of the resources associated with those objects, that's done by the uh, Java runtime. So the programmer is not normally involved uh, in cleaning up the um, resources associated with an object. Right? Sometimes you have to. Uh, so for example, if you open a file, you should close the file, right? but you're not responsible. The programmer is not responsible for freeing the memory um, associated with the object. All right, so I'm just going to quickly flick back the teams to see if I've got any questions. All right. OK, so to create an object. So we've already seen this um, before when we used arrays. Right? To make any object in Java, or to create an object in Java, um, the most common way to do so is to use the new operator. Right? It's not the only way, but it's the most common way. Um, so you use new, and then you call what's called a constructor after new. What does new do? Right. So new uh, does the allocation of the memory for the new object. Right. So when you write new, that's sort of like it's similar to, but not exactly the same thing um, as calling malloc in uh, C. Right. Allocate memory for the object. Uh, but when you use new, you have to do something else at the same time. Right. You also have to call what's called the constructor. Right. So the constructor is the routine. Uh, defined by a class that initializes the state of a new object. Right? So remember, our objects have information in them. The constructor sets the initial value of the information in the object. That's what the constructor should always do. Uh, and then finally, after new and the con after new calls the constructor, the constructor finishes running. New returns a reference to the new object that was just initialized. So new plus the constructor does memory allocation plus initialization, and then returns uh, the initialized object back to the caller. So here's an example using some of the classes, um, one of the classes in, that's described in the course notebooks. Um, so when you get to the part two of the notes, um, you'll see this class called point two. Right now, you shouldn't be at you shouldn't be at this point in the notes yet. Right, so we're not there yet in the, in the notebooks. We're still halfway through part one. But there's this class called point two that's described in the course notebooks. Right now, point two is just a two dimensional point. Right, so it's a two dimensional Cartesian point. And I know that with your engineering background, you've seen these a bazillion times already. Right, you would have done this in physics and a whole bunch of other places already. Right, so uh, it's a two dimensional Cartesian point. It has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, both represented as double values. Right. So how do I use this class point two, or how do I make uh, these point objects? Right. Well, I use new. Right. Uh, and then I call a constructor. Right. So in this case, I'm calling um, the constructor called big P points two. Right. With no arguments. Right. So I'm not passing in any arguments to this particular constructor. Uh, it turns out this constructor, right, on line one, initializes the point so that its coordinates are zero zero. Right, so you end up with the point zero zero. I can then make a second point object. Right, coordinates are one and point five. I now have two point objects sitting in memory, right, and their states are here and here. Right, so I've got one point that's zero zero. I have another point that's one and point five. Right, and then finally, there's a third example here. Right, so here I call point the constructor again. Right, so I use new to make a new object, call the constructor. Right, and this time I pass in a reference to the second point. Right, so P2 is here. Who refers to or points to the point object whose coordinates are one and point five. Right, I can pass an object. Well, in this case, I can pass an object, another point two object to the constructor will copy the coordinates of that point two object and return uh, and with new will return another point whose coordinates are the same as the previous point. 
right? So I now have three point objects in memory, right? Two of them happen to have the same coordinates, right? But they're distinct objects, right? So if I change the coordinates of this point, the coordinates of this object do not change, right? They are distinct and separate in this case. Uh, here's another example using something called a scanner. Uh, so a scanner is how you would read input from the key. So a scanner is an object that you can use to read input from the keyboard. Right? We're not going to use it a lot in this course because I don't like teaching a course where people write programs where you sit at a keyboard and it prompts you to type stuff in and then something happens. Um, if you do have to write a program like that, and you almost never do, except in like an introductory programming course, right? Uh, then you can use a scanner object in Java. Right? So scanner object, I can tell it to read system.in, right? Uh, for C program, a system.in, that's the same thing as a uh, standard input, right? As your standard input stream. Uh, so that will read from the keyboard, right? Uh, so this makes a, so new scanner system in uh, makes a scanner object that will read the keyboard. Right, and uh, that returns a reference that I can store in the variable S1. Uh, and then you can use S1 uh, to get input from the keyboard. Uh, but you can make scanners uh, that read other sources of information. Right, so instead of scanning standard input, I can scan a string. I can use a string, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. I can use that as input to my scanner. Right, so I can have the scanner scan this string. Right, and so to do that, I just make a new scanner object and I pass in the string um, as an argument. Right now, how do I know what constructors exist in the class? Well, you look at the documentation for the class. Right, so that's the uh, that's oh that's the standard answer, right? So how do I call a constructor? Well, go find the class documentation and look up the constructors. Right, they're all near the top of the page, uh, near the top of the documentation page. Uh, of course, in this course, I'll also be showing you lots of examples of calling constructors when we're using um, certain classes, when we're using classes. OK, so when you use new, right, you always have to follow it with a constructor. So that's the uh, that's the only way to use new, right? So it's always new space constructor name. Right? It looks like a method call uh, or it looks like a function call in C. Right, uh, but it turns out Java does not consider constructors to be methods. Um, so in Java, constructors are well, they're just, they're called, just called constructors, right? They look like methods. They're not quite methods, right? Why are they not methods? Because they never return a value, right? They don't even return void, right? Uh, so when you call new constructor, right, it's not the constructor that's returning the object that's initialized. It's new. That's returning the object that become, that's initialized by the constructor, right? Constructor does the initialization. New returns um, a reference to the object that was initialized. Right? They initialize the state of the newly created object, right? So in other words, they set all of the fields belonging to the object. Uh, at least that's what they're supposed to do. Um, okay, so some of these constructors have special names. Right, so has no arguments, right? So in other words, it's just constructor name round bracket round bracket. Uh, that's called the uh, no arguments constructor for obvious reasons, right? It has no arguments. Uh, so that's the no argument constructor. Occasionally, you might see it called the default constructor. Um, its proper name is the no argument constructor. Right now, what should a no argument constructor do? Right, so the caller is saying, hey, give me a point to object. I don't care what the state of the object is, right? Or I don't want to specify what the state of the newly created object is, right? The job of the no argument constructor is to put the object into some well-defined default state, right? A two object, right? So if for a two dimensional point, what's a sensible uh, default state? Well, zero, zero is a sensible default state. Could argue there's lots of other sensible default states, right? So you could argue that maybe one one or one zero or zero one, uh, those all might be sensible default states for a point. Um, 
Um, if you are implementing the point two class, right, you could implement your no argument constructor so that it produces a different point than zero zero. So uh, remember, when you implement a class, you're defining your own type. Uh, so you do have some freedom in how your constructors and methods work. Um, but what it should do, uh, what it, it should not do, uh, or it probably should not do, is it probably should not randomize uh, or set the state of the point to some random coordinates. Right? Uh, that doesn't make so much sense in this case. Now, a class does not have to define the no argument constructor. Right? So you always have to look at the documentation for a class to see what constructors it has. Um, it's not always the case that a class has a no argument constructor. Right, so there's lots of classes where uh, you, the class, it doesn't make sense to initialize an object without information from the caller. Right. Uh, a copy constructor, so this is the second kind of, uh, this is the second uh, special constructor, right? So a copy constructor is a constructor that has exactly one input. And that input has the same type as the class that it's defined in. OK, so here is our point two copy constructor. I've got a copy constructor. Whose input argument. Has the same type as the uh, class that is defined in. Right, so in other words, I have a point two. the copy constructor for point two. Takes in another point two object. Right, copy constructor is to initialize the new object by copying the state of another object. So that's how you copy objects in, or this is one way to copy objects in Java, right? If the class that you're using has a copy constructor, then it's telling you this is a, this is an easy way to copy uh, objects of this type. That's an error. Not every class defines a copy constructor. Again, you have to look at the. Oh, I have to. Right. So if you want to copy an object, right, then uh, one of the first things you should do is check the documentation for the class and see it has a see if it has a copy constructor. Right. If it does, uh, then that's the easy way uh, to make a copy of an object. Right. And then finally, all the other constructors in a class, uh, they don't have any special name. Right. Uh, so your class can define as many constructors as it wants. Right? So you can define uh, multiple constructors. Right. There are some rules on um, whether or not you can add a particular constructor, but we'll get to that later in the course. Right. Uh, but here's an example where there's a third constructor that takes in the two coordinates of the newly created point. Right, so this is a constructor that lets the caller set the coordinates of the new point. Right, and so for the point two class, this makes sense to have this third constructor. Uh, the scanner class, that was another example, right? So we have a scan, we have one constructor that will take in what's called an input stream. Right, and we have a second constructor that'll take in a stream. OK, so once you've got an object, so I've made, I've got a, I've somehow got a reference to an object, right? Either I've made it myself using new and a constructor call, uh, or I've gotten it from somewhere else, right? So maybe I called a method somewhere that returns an object reference, right? Once I have that reference, uh, I'm allowed to use it, right? So you can use an object via a reference to the object, right? So for you guys, this is, um, you can use, an object, uh, so you can you can think of this if you have a pointer to something, right? Then I can use the something, right? So if I have a reference to an object, then I can use the object, right? So this is similar to a pointer to a uh, type in C. Now you know that in C you can dereference the pointer to get the object directly, but you can't do that in Java, right? So in Java there's no way for the programmer to uh, directly get the object itself, right? You're always accessing objects indirectly via a reference. Now, what can you do with objects? Well, objects perform actions by uh, running their methods, right? So to call a method on an object, right? You use a reference name or just a variable, right? 
variable that points to or refers to an object, then you use the dot, and it's always the dot in Java, right? Uh, method name. Right? So that's the name of the method, and then you pass in whatever arguments, right? So this part here, the method name arguments, that's the same thing as calling a function in C. Function name, comma separated list of arguments. Well, it's, it's all exactly the same. The only difference is you uh, need a, um, if you're calling an instance method, right? So a non-static method, then you need a reference to an object here. Uh, so again, example using the point to class. Right? Uh, here's my point to object with the coordinates 0.5 and 0.1. Right? If I want to get the x coordinate of the point referred to by p, write p dot x, and then the round brackets. Right? So this is calling a method. Right? Call a method, you always need to use the round brackets after the method. Right? So just like calling a function. Uh, so p dot so the method called x that happens to return the x coordinate for the point two class. Right? The method called y happens to return the y coordinate for the point two class. For example, x will be equal to point five and y will be equal to point one. Right? If I change the values of x and y, I can then go back and change the coordinates of the point. So there's a method having the same name as that method there. So method called x, but it takes in one double value that chain. And so this version of the method will change the x coordinate of the point pointed to by p to whatever that value is. Right. So that changes the x coordinate of p to what is this 0.6 now, I guess. Similarly with y, there's a method called y that takes in one double value. It changes the coordinates of the point referred to by p to that value there. Right, so this will set the coordinates of point P to zero, uh, the Y coordinate to zero. And finally, if I want to, there's a method called set that lets me change both coordinates at the same time. And so that's how that's an example of how you would use an object uh, to call methods um, with the object. Now it's based, it's 18 after the hour, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, anybody have any questions about creating objects and using methods with objects? Right. It's uh, again, um, I'm just using examples with the point two class because it's an easy class for you to understand. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, right? So we haven't seen it. Um, we haven't looked at its documentation. Um, so I'm just giving you simple examples now of using that particular class. Right. Uh, for the time being, uh, well, we'll see more examples of different uh, classes um, coming up in the next few lectures. Right. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where you uh, actually implement the point two class. Right. Okay, uh, where do all of these predefined classes come from? Who creates them and how does my computer access them? That's a good question. So uh, Java has a standard library, right? So whenever you uh, with the Java development kit, right? With the Java development kit is something called the Java standard library. The standard library contains, I don't know how many, it's literally thousands of classes, right? Uh, so it already comes with thousands of predefined classes and other things available for the programmer to use. Right. Uh, so if you uh, look at the documentation uh, for any of the, oh, why don't I just do that quickly? So if I do something like, uh, so let's look at this documentation for string. Make that a little bigger. Right. Uh, if you start to click around some of these links, right? So suppose I click on package, right? Uh, and there's something called this package called java.lang. So these are all the classes that are fundamental to the design of the Java programming language. You're going to see a bunch of stuff, right? So here are the classes have started to appear. And there's a whole bunch of them, right? This is just one of the many different packages uh, that are part of the language. So if I click on the overview, here are all your packages, right? Within each one of these packages, there are classes and other packages, right? Inside of those packages are more classes and other packages. These are all already defined and come part of the standard language, right? So unlike C, which comes with a very Spartan standard library, uh, Java comes with a very rich standard library. Furthermore, uh, an individual programmer can create their own classes. 
right? So that you can create your own user defined types. So for example, every type, every data structure that you learn in your data structures course, you can make a corresponding type for uh, and then use that in your program. Uh, when do you not need a variable to call a method? The only time you do not need a variable to call a method is if it's static, and then you need the class name to call the method. There is no other way to call a method in Java. You either use an object name, uh, an object reference, or you use a class name. Right. So it's, to call a method, it's always something dot method name. Right. If the method's static, you should use the class name. If the method is not static, you have to use a reference. All right, any other questions? Oh, do we generally have a lot of classes? Yes, generally you have. Uh, so uh, in a large Java program, you would have literally have thousands of classes uh, interacting with one, uh, thousands of classes and thousands of objects interacting with one another. Yep. Uh, and you have to remember that when you use a class, normally that uh, often that class, or sorry, when you use a, an object, often the that object is defined so that inside that object there's other objects, right? And inside that object there's other objects, and so on and so on and so on, right? So you end up with a lot of dependencies. Um, all right, any other questions? So we're a little bit over time now, um, so I should let you go. Uh, look for the first assignment coming out either this afternoon. It's probably going to be tomorrow, though, but I'm going to try to get it out this afternoon to you. OK, and uh, lab two will come out this week as well.